Chapter 17 What is Wisdom? These days my ears perk up whenever I come across a story in which one person deeply saw another. For example, recently a friend mentioned to me that his daughter had been struggling in second grade. She felt like she wasn't quite fitting in with her classmates. But then one day her teacher said to her, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. That one comment, my friend said, helped turn his daughter's whole year around. Something that she might have perceived as a weakness her quietness or social awkwardness was now perceived as a strength. Her teacher saw her. That story reminded me of a time when one of my teachers deeply saw me, though in a different way. I was in 11th grade English, making some kind of smart-ass observation in class, as I was prone to do. My teacher barked at me in front of the whole class, David, you're trying to get by on glibness. Stop it. I felt humiliated, and strangely honored. I thought, wow she really knows me. I was indeed talking to show off in those days, not talking to contribute. I learned, thanks to her, that I had to fight against my facility with words, I had to slow down and metabolize what I was thinking, so the ideas would come from my inner depths and not just off the top of my head. A woman told me about the time when she was 13 and she went to her first party and had her first alcohol. She was dropped off at home so drunk that all she could do was lie on the front porch, barely able to move. Her father a big, strict disciplinarian came out and she thought he was going to scream at her the very thoughts she was thinking about herself, I'm bad. I'm bad. Instead, he scooped her up in his arms and carried her inside and placed her on the living room couch and said, There'll be no punishment here. You've had an experience. He knew what she was thinking, she felt seen. Sometimes in history books I come across occasions in which one person sees into the core of another. For example, one day in the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt was hosting a 28-year-old congressman named Lyndon Johnson in the White House. After Johnson left his office, FDR turned to his aide Harold Ickes and said, You know, Harold, that's the kind of uninhibited young pro I might have been as a young man if I hadn't gone to Harvard. FDR continued with a prediction, in the next couple of generations the balance of power in this country is going to shift to the South and the West. And that kid Lyndon Johnson could well be the first Southern president. I've also come to savor those moments when a novelist gives you piercing insights into one of his or her characters. Guy de Maupassant captured one of the characters this way, he was a gentleman with red whiskers who always went first through a doorway. With that one line, I felt a whole character was revealed a guy who was pushy, competitive, full of himself. I like to think of these little everyday insights as moments of wisdom. Wisdom isn't knowing about physics or geography. Wisdom is knowing about people. Wisdom is the ability to see deeply into who people are and how they should move in the complex situations of life. That's the great gift illuminators share with those around them. My view of what a wise person looks like has been transformed over the past couple of years, as I have been researching this book. I used to have a conventional view of wisdom. The wise person is that lofty sage who doles out life-altering advice in the manner of Yoda, Dumbledore, or Solomon. The wise person knows how to solve your problems, knows what job you should take, can tell you whether or not you should marry the person you're dating. 
we're all attracted to this version of wisdom because we all want easy answers delivered on a silver platter. Yet when I think of the wise people in my own life now, I realize it's not the people capable of delivering a sparkling lecture or dropping a life-altering maxim that pop first to mind. Now I take the more or less opposite view of wisdom. I've come to believe that wise people don't tell us what to do, they start by witnessing our story. They take the anecdotes, rationalizations, and episodes we tell, and see us in a noble struggle. They see the way we're navigating the dialectics of life intimacy versus independence, control versus uncertainty and understand that our current self is just where we are right now, part of a long continuum of growth. The really good confidants the people we go to when we are troubled are more like coaches than philosopher kings. They take in your story, accept it, but push you to clarify what it is you really want, or to name the baggage you left out of your clean tail. They ask you to probe into what is really bothering you, to search for the deeper problem underneath the convenient surface problem you've come to them for help about. Wise people don't tell you what to do, they help you process your own thoughts and emotions. They enter with you into your process of meaning making and then help you expand it, push it along. All choice involves loss, if you take this job, you don't take that one. Much of life involves reconciling opposites, I want to be attached, but I also want to be free. Wise people create a safe space where you can navigate the ambiguities and contradictions we all wrestle with. They prod and lure you along until your own obvious solution emerges into view. Their essential gift is receptivity, the capacity to receive what you are sending. This is not a passive skill. The wise person is not just keeping her ears open. She is creating an atmosphere of hospitality, an atmosphere in which people are encouraged to set aside their fear of showing weakness, their fear of confronting themselves. She is creating an atmosphere in which people swap stories, trade confidences. In this atmosphere people are free to be themselves, encouraged to be honest with themselves. The knowledge that results from your encounter with a wise person is personal and contextual, not a generalization that can be captured in a maxim that can be pinned to a bulletin board. It is particular to your unique self and your unique situation. Wise people help you come up with a different way of looking at yourself, your past, and the world around you. Very often they focus your attention on your relationships, the in-between spaces that are so easy to overlook. How can this friendship or this marriage be nourished and improved? The wise person sees your gifts and potential, even the ones you do not see. Being seen in this way has a tendency to turn down the pressure, offering you some distance from your immediate situation, offering hope. We all know people who are smart. But that doesn't mean they are wise. Understanding and wisdom come from surviving the pitfalls of life, thriving in life, having wide and deep contact with other people. Out of your own moments of suffering, struggle, friendship, intimacy, and joy comes a compassionate awareness of how other people feel their frailty, their confusion, and their courage. The wise are those who have lived full, varied lives, and reflected deeply on what they've been through. This is a lofty ideal. None of us are going to be that perceptive about other people all of the time. But I believe in lofty ideals. I believe in holding up standards of excellence. As Hurston's mother put it, we should all try to jump at the sun. Even if we don't reach it, we'll still reach higher than before. And if we falter, 
at least it won't be because we had an inadequate ideal. Let me close this book with four more cases in which one human being saw deeply into another human being. I think we have a few more things to learn about this skill from these examples. The first involves the writer Tracy Kidder, who was born in New York City in 1945. A couple of decades ago, Kidder met an African man named Diagrasha who was three decades younger and had grown up in the rural hills of Burundi. He eventually wrote a book about Deo, called Strength in What Remains. This book is proof that it really is possible to know another person deeply, even a person very different from yourself. As the book opens, Deo is 22 years old. We are inside his head as he boards an airplane for the first time in his life traveling from Burundi to New York City. He has spent his life in a rural village with cows, his little school, and his family. The plane is the largest man-made object he has ever seen. Kidder has us feeling his wonder. Deo sees the interior of the plane with startled eyes. He sees chairs in perfect rows, and notices that they have white cloths draped over their tops. This was the most nicely appointed room he'd ever seen, Kidder writes. As the plane takes off, Deo is terrified, but he finds the cushioned chair very comfortable, and he enjoys the feeling of flight, how wonderful to travel in an easy chair instead of on foot. One thing that puzzles him is that the literature in the pouch in front of him is not in French. He'd been told since elementary school that French was the universal language, used all around the world. He finally lands in New York with $200, no English, and no friends or even contacts. Strangers help him survive, and before long he is working as a delivery boy for a grocery store and sleeping in Central Park. A former nun named Sharon adopts Deo as her project. She helps him find shelter, legal status, and a future. Kidder lets us see how uncomfortable Deo a mature, independent man feels to be on the receiving end of charity, she was like a mother, who couldn't stop worrying about you, who couldn't help reminding you that you still needed her help, which was infuriating because in fact you did. More strangers come along and help him. Deo shows one middle-aged American the books he has brought from Burundi. The American tells his wife, this man loves books. He needs to go to school. They enroll him in an English as a second language course at Hunter College. They take him to visit colleges, and the second Deo walks through the gates of Columbia, he thinks, this is a university. He enrolls in Columbia's American language program. His new friends pay the tuition of $6,000. He finally takes a group of entrance exams, including the SAT and a calculus test. He finishes the latter before the other test takers and brings it up to the proctor, who takes a look at his answers, smiles at him, and, beaming, says, Do gracious. Well done. Just a couple years after arriving in New York with nothing, he is a student at an Ivy League college. He studies medicine and philosophy, because he wants to close the gap between what he'd experienced and what he was able to say. What he experienced before coming to New York is the core of his story. Years before, Deo had been working in a health care center in Burundi when a genocide broke out, Hutus massacring Tutsis. One day, Deo heard trucks, whistles, militia in the courtyard outside. He ran to his room and hid under his bed. He heard people pleading, don't kill me. Then shots, the smell of burning flesh. Then it became quiet, 
except for the sounds of dogs fighting over the bodies of the dead. That night was dark, and when the killing subsided Deo started running. Over the next four days he walked 45 miles, to get away from the genocide. He saw a dead mother slumped against a tree, with her baby still alive, but Deo could not take it with him. Kidder captures Deo's mind as he experiences all this, it was as if the sights and sounds and smells of the past few days screams, corpses, burning flesh were all collecting into something like another version of himself, another skin growing over him. The trip on foot out of Burundi was haunted by more bodies, more menace, the constant threat that every person he encountered might take a machete to his head. Kidder met Deo more than a decade after that trek, after he had, by that point, moved to New York and graduated from Columbia. Kidder heard the outline of Deo's story, but decided that this was a tale he wanted to capture in a book only when Deo confided to him that in the days when he was sleeping in Central Park, he would always sneak into the park after dark, when no one would notice him. He didn't want strangers looking down on him, seeing him as a pathetic homeless man. There was much in Deo's life that Kidder couldn't relate to, but this fear of the judgmental eyes of strangers, this cringing under the disdain of people he would never know that emotion Kidder was familiar with, and that emotion could be a bridge between their experiences. Deo was a tough subject to interview. The culture of Burundi is stoical. It's a language that has not one but two words for bringing up something from the past, and they are both negative, Kidder told me. But gradually, over two years of conversations, Deo's story came out. I don't see any way of doing this without spending time with a person, Kidder said. If you spend time, what you want to know will creep out. The key is to listen, to be attentive, to be patient and not interrupt. Kidder told me he likes the version of himself that comes out when he's trying to learn about another. He's humbler, not talking so much. Kidder didn't merely interview Deo, he accompanied him to the places where his story played out. They went back and visited the spot where he slept in Central Park, the supermarket where he worked as a delivery boy. Their walks together were a way of planting themselves in the concrete details of Deo's experience. Eventually, they went to Burundi, to trace his journey through the genocide. As they drove toward the hospital where Deo had hidden under the bed while his neighbors were massacred outside, Kidder felt a creeping sensation across his skin. There was some evil presence in this place. The trip was taking them too deep inside something that felt dark and menacing. Maybe we should just go back, Kidder said to Deo from the back seat of the car as they approached the hospital. Deo replied, you may not see the ocean but right now we are in the middle of the ocean and we have to keep swimming. When they arrived at the hospital, Kidder told me, Deo slipped into a kind of angry trance, which manifested itself as a fierce and false smile for all who greeted him. The hospital was now an empty shell, a Potemkin facility with a doctor who wasn't really a doctor and no patients. They finally made it to the room where Deo had hidden. Deo had tried to describe his nightmares to me, Kidder writes about that visit. In the telling, they hadn't seemed unusual. Everyone has bad dreams, up until now I hadn't fully understood the difference, that even his most lurid dreams weren't weirder or more frightening than what inspired them. He didn't wake up from his nightmares thankful they weren't real. The evil atmosphere was palpable. Kidder was now tasting Deo's experience in a more visceral way, this was a place of unreason, 
and at that moment I had no faith in the power of reason against it. Part of the problem, I think, was that for a moment I didn't trust Deo. The smile he turned on the doctor was radiant. I had never seen him so angry. Periodically, while working on the book, Kidder felt guilty for bringing Deo back into the trauma of his past. Kidder could see the damage the genocide had done to Deo. There were times when he would suddenly erupt with anger. At other times he would disappear inside himself. A friend said it was like Deo had no protective shell, everything he touched penetrated him so deeply and was felt so powerfully. I read strength in what remains with a kind of awe. Kidder not only created a rich, complex portrait of Deo, he enabled us to see the world through his eyes. When I called Kidder to talk about the book, Deo's brother was staying at his house, and had become a family friend. Deo himself had gone back to Burundi to open a health center for the kinds of people he grew up with, including members of the Hutu tribe that had tried to massacre him. Kidder's curiosity about Deo was still pulsating as we spoke, though it had been a decade since his book came out. I've tried to learn from Kidder to be more patiently attentive. I've learned to try to accompany people through the concrete particulars of their lives, and not be content with the much rehearsed stories. I've learned that it really is possible to see people whose experiences are radically different from your own. From Deo, I've learned something about trust. Deo found in Kidder a man he could gradually tell his story to. And when he found that man, and bore witness to what he'd been through, he gave a gift to the world. The second case study involves Lori Gottlieb, the therapist we met in Chapter 14. She once told me that most people have their answers inside them, but they need a guide so they can hear themselves figure it out. In her book Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, she describes a journey she took with a man called John. John was your classic self-absorbed, narcissistic jerk. By day he worked as a writer on fabulously successful TV shows, winning Emmy after Emmy. But he was a monster to everyone around him, cruel, inattentive, impatient, demeaning. He came to therapy because he was having trouble sleeping, because his marriage was crumbling, because his daughters were acting out. At first, he treated Gottlieb the way he treated everyone else, like an idiot he had to tolerate. He pulled out his phone during therapy sessions and she had to text him from across the room to get his attention. He ordered lunch for himself so he could multitask while he talked to her. He called her his hooker, because he paid her for her time. John's dominant narrative was that he was the alpha performer, the successful one, but that he was surrounded by mediocrities. Gottlieb could have reduced John to a category, narcissistic personality disorder. But, she told me, I didn't want to lose the person behind the diagnosis. She knew from prior experience that people who are demanding, critical, and angry tend to be intensely lonely. She intuited that there was some internal struggle inside John, that there were feelings he was hiding from, which he had built moats and fortresses to keep away. She kept telling herself, have compassion, have compassion, have compassion. She later explained to me that behavior is how we speak the unspeakable. John couldn't speak something unspeakable, so he did it by being rude to others and by having the sense of himself as better than everybody else. Her first task with John was to establish a relationship with him, to make him feel felt. Her method, as she describes it, is in this room, I'm going to see you, 
and you'll try to hide, but I'll still see you, and it's going to be okay when I do. Gottlieb showed enormous forbearance with John, overlooking the countless episodes when he was a jerk, waiting for a sign of what bigger trauma he was grieving. Successful friendship, like successful therapy, is a balance of deference and defiance. It involves showing positive regard, but also calling people on their self-deceptions. The Buddhists have a useful phrase for unconditional positive regard, idiot compassion, which is the kind of empathy that never challenges people's stories or threatens to hurt their feelings. It consoles but also conceals. So Gottlieb challenged John, but not too aggressively. She realized she could only prod him at the pace he was comfortable with or he would flee. She was trying to make him curious about himself with her questions. Typically therapists are several steps ahead of their patients, she writes, not because we're smarter or wiser but because we have the vantage point of being outside their lives. As Gottlieb accompanied him, John's story about himself got less distorted. Experiences that he had been hiding began to bubble out. One day, John mentioned, in a matter-of-fact tone, that his mother had died when he was six. A teacher, she was exiting the school when she saw a student in the street in the path of a speeding car. She ran into the street, pushed the student out of the way, but was killed herself. Gottlieb wondered if John was told to bury his emotions and expected to show strength after his mother's death. One day John was venting about all the stresses in his life. He was talking about how his wife and daughters were ganging up on him and he blurted out, and Gabe is getting so emotional. Gottlieb had often heard him talk about his daughters but asked, who is Gabe? He flushed and evaded the question. Gottlieb persisted, who's Gabe? A wash of emotions swept across his face. Finally, he said, Gabe is my son. He picked up his phone and walked out of the office. Weeks later, when he finally returned, he revealed that he had had a son. The sentence about Gabe being emotional must have hurtled out from somewhere in his unconscious because Gabe was dead. When Gabe was six, the whole family was driving to Legoland. John was at the wheel when his cell phone rang. John and his wife started arguing about the way the phone intruded into their lives. Eventually John looked down to see who had called him and at that instant an SUV hit them head on. Gabe was killed. John never knew if his act of glancing at his phone was the crucial error. If he'd been looking at the road, could he have avoided the SUV? Would it have hit them anyway? John was finally learning to tell a truer story about his life. As this happened, he found that he was able to spend an evening with his wife and have a wonderful time. He was able to accept that sometimes he would be happy and sometimes he would be sad. In letting Gottlieb see him, he had arrived at a new way to see himself. I don't want your head to get too big or anything, he told Gottlieb, but I thought, you have a more complete picture of my total humanity than anyone else in my life. Gottlieb writes of that moment, I'm so moved I can't speak. I like the Gottlieb and John story because it illuminates many of the gentle skills it takes to be truly receptive particularly, the ability to be generous about human frailty, to be patient and let others emerge at their own pace but it also illuminates the mental toughness that is sometimes required. The wise person is there not to be walked over but to stand up for the actual truth, to call the other person out when need be, if they are hiding from some hard reality. 
Receptivity without confrontation leads to a bland neutrality that serves nobody, the theologian Henry Nguyen wrote. Confrontation without receptivity leads to an oppressive aggression which hurts everybody. The third case study is from a scene in a movie you've probably seen, Good Will Hunting. In the first section of the movie, Will Hunting, an orphan and a math prodigy, played by Matt Damon, goes from triumph to triumph, effortlessly solving math problems, deflating pompous grad students with his superior knowledge, leveling others with his wit. He gets into a fight with a gang member who used to bully him, winds up attacking a responding police officer, and is arrested. He can avoid jail time, as long as he is treated by a therapist, played by Robin Williams. Over the course of the movie, the therapist creates a zone of hospitality where Will can lay down his defenses. They bond over the Red Sox, they share each other's traumas. But at one point Will makes fun of the therapist, belittles him, criticizes a painting he has made just as he's belittled and teased most other people in the movie. The therapist is devastated by Will Hunting's simplification of his life. He's tortured and sleepless for part of a night. Then a realization creeps across his mind. This kid doesn't actually know what he's talking about. Will Hunting may know math, may have information, but he doesn't know how to see people. The Robin Williams character invites Will to meet him on a park bench, in front of a pond, and tells him the truth, you're a tough kid. I ask you about war, and you'll probably throw Shakespeare at me, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been near one. You've never held your best friend's head in your lap and watched him gasp his last breath, looking to you for help. And if I asked you about love, you'd probably quote me a sonnet. But you've never looked at a woman and been totally vulnerable. Known someone who could level you with her eyes. Feeling like God put an angel on earth just for you, who could rescue you from the depths of hell. I look at you, I don't see an intelligent confident man, I see a cocky, scared shitless kid. But you're a genius, Will. No one denies that, personally, I don't give a shit about all that, because you know what? I can't learn anything from you I can't read in some fucking book. Unless you wanna talk about you, who you are. And I'm fascinated. I'm in. But you don't want to do that, do you, sport? You're terrified of what you might say. The therapist gets up and leaves. As he was speaking, you could see an expression of self-recognition creep across Will Hunting's face. You could see that Will Hunting already knew this about himself but didn't trust himself to face these hard truths. He'd been hiding from himself. To me, this speech flows from great listening. The therapist has heard not only what Will said but what Will didn't say about the fear and vulnerability that came from his life as an orphan. He's heard the deepest secret that Will wants to hide. He puts that shameful secret on the table and says, in effect, I know this about you, and I care for you anyway. The therapist is prodding Will toward a different way of knowing, the kind of knowing I've been reaching for and trying to push us toward in this book. He's moving Will beyond an impersonal way of knowing, a catalogue of facts, which Will has mastered and uses as a defensive fortress. The therapist is prodding Will toward a personal way of knowing, the kind of knowledge that is earned only by those willing to take emotional risks, to open themselves up to people and experiences and fully feel what those people and experiences are about. 
This is the kind of knowledge held not only in the brain but in the heart and body. The therapist has bestowed a painful and important honor. He sees Will as he is, even in the ways he is stunted. The therapist sees what Will has the potential to become and points him toward the way to get there. The Good Will Hunting story is an education in how to critique with care. It's about how to tell someone about their shortcomings in a way that offers maximal support. Let me give you a trivial, everyday example of why critiquing with care can be so effective. When I'm writing, I sometimes unconsciously know that a part of what I'm writing is not working. I have these vague vibrations that something is wrong, kind of like the vibrations you feel when you leave the house and you subtly sense you've left something important behind but you don't know what. I often suppress these vibrations because I'm lazy or I want to be finished with the work. Invariably a good editor will locate the exact spot I semi-consciously knew wasn't working. It's only when the editor has named it for me that I fully face the fact that I need to make some changes. Critiquing with care works best when someone names something we ourselves almost but did not quite know. Critiquing with care works best when that naming happens within a context of unconditional regard, that just and loving attention that conveys unshakable respect for another person's struggles. This is what our friends do for us. They not only delight us and call forth our best, friends also hold up a mirror so we can see ourselves in ways that would not otherwise be accessible. When we see ourselves that way, we have the opportunity to improve, to become our fuller selves. A man with few friends is only half developed, the radical writer Randolph Bourne observed. There are whole sides of his nature which are locked up and have never been expressed. He cannot unlock them himself, he cannot discover them, friends alone can stimulate him and open them. Not long ago I was at a dinner party at which two very good novelists were present. Someone asked how they began the process of writing their novels. Did they start with a character and then build the story around that, or did they start with an idea for a plot and then create characters who operate within that story? They both said they didn't use either of these approaches. Instead, they said, they started with a relationship. They started with the kernel of an idea about how one sort of person might be in a relationship with another sort of person. They started to imagine how the people in that relationship would be alike and different, what tensions there would be, how the relationship would grow, falter, or flourish. Once they had a sense of that relationship, and how two such characters would bounce off and change each other, then the characters would flesh out in their minds. And then a plot tracing the course of that relationship would become evident. Listening to them that night helped me read novels differently. Now when I'm reading a novel I ask, what is the relationship at the center of this book? With good novels there will generally be one such central relationship, or perhaps a few core relationships will drive everything else. But that conversation also helped me see something bigger, that wisdom is not mostly a trait possessed by an individual. Wisdom is a social skill practiced within a relationship or a system of relationships. Wisdom is practiced when people come together to form what Parker Palmer called a community of truth. A community of truth can be as simple as a classroom a teacher and students investigating some problem together. It can be two people at a table in a coffee shop, noodling over some problem. It can be as grand as the scientific enterprise. Science moves forward as thousands of minds dispersed all across the world pool their separate imaginations to look together at some problem. Or it can be as intimate as one person alone reading a book. 
one author's mind and one reader's mind coming together, sparking insight. Toni Morrison once wrote, Frederick Douglass talking about his grandmother, and James Baldwin talking about his father, and Simone de Beauvoir talking about her mother, these people are my access to me, they are my entrance into my own interior life. A community of truth is created when people are genuinely interested in seeing and exploring together. They do not try to manipulate each other. They do not immediately judge, saying, that's stupid or that's right. Instead, they pause to consider what the meaning of the statement is to the person who just uttered it. When we are in a community of truth, we're trying on each other's perspectives. We're taking journeys into each other's minds. It gets you out of the egotistical mindset I am normal, what I see is objective, everyone else is odd and instead gives you the opportunity to take a journey with another person's eyes. A funny thing happens to people in a community of truth. Somebody has a thought. The thought is like a little circuit in their brain. When someone shares a thought and others receive it, then suddenly the same circuit is in two brains. When a whole classroom is considering the thought, it's like the same circuit in 25 brains. Our minds are intermingling. The cognitive scientist Douglas Hofstadter calls these circuits loops. He argues that when we communicate, and loops are flowing through different brains, we are thinking as one shared organism, anticipating each other, finishing each other's sentences. Empathy is not a strong enough word to describe this intermingling. It is not one person, one body, one brain that marks this condition, Hofstadter argues, but the interpenetration of all minds in ceaseless conversation with each other. Let's say you're in a book club. You've been meeting for years and years. Sometimes you can no longer remember which ideas were yours and which were someone else's. You come to see that all your conversations over the years have been woven together into one long conversation. It's almost as if the club has its own distinct voice, one greater than the individual voice of each member. Two sorts of knowledge have been generated here. The first kind, of course, is a deeper understanding of the books. The second kind of knowledge is more subtle and important. It's knowledge about the club. It's each member's awareness of the dynamics of the group, what role each member tends to take in the conversations, what gifts each member brings. Maybe it's misleading to use the word knowledge here. Maybe it's more accurate to call this second kind of knowledge an awareness. It's the highly attuned sense each person has for how the conversation should be pushed along, for when to talk and when to hold back, when to call in a member who has been quiet. This is the kind of awareness that can be achieved only by a group of people practicing the skills we've explored in this book. There are magical moments in a community of truth, when people deeply talk with crystalline honesty and respect. As I mentioned near the start, I don't try to teach by argument, I try to teach by example. I'll conclude the book with one final example of seeing and being seen. I came across it in Catherine Schultz's recent memoir Lost and Found. Schultz's dad, Isaac, was one of the millions of Europeans whose lives were tossed about by the events of the 20th century. During World War II and the years after, he bounced around from Palestine, to post-war Germany, and eventually to the United States. He grew to adulthood, became a lawyer, and offered his family the kind of happiness and stability he had not known as a child. He was a cheerful, talkative man. 
he was curious about everything and had something to say about everything the novels of Edith Wharton, the infield fly rule in baseball, whether apple cobblers were better than apple crisps. When they were young, he read to his daughters each night, play-acting the characters in the stories with dramatic voices and hilarious gestures. Some nights he just ditched the books entirely and crafted suspenseful stories out of his childhood riling his daughters into a peak of excitement at the time of the day when his theoretical parental job was to soothe them before bed. Schultz's portrait is of a warm, curious, and gregarious guy, the anchor of his family a man who turned his family into a community of truth. His health gradually failed him during the last decade of his life, and then toward the end, he just stopped talking. His doctors could not explain it, nor could his family. Talking was his great delight. One night, as he was fading toward death, the family gathered around him. I had always regarded my family as close, so it was startling to realize how much closer we could get, how near we drew around his waning flame, Schultz wrote. That evening the members of the family went around the room and took turns talking to their father. They each said the things they didn't want to leave unsaid. They each told him what he had given them and how honorably he had lived his life. Schultz described the scene, my father, mute but seemingly alert, looked from one face to the next as we spoke, his brown eyes shining with tears. I had always hated to see him cry, and seldom did, but for once, I was grateful. It gave me hope that, for what may have been the last time in his life, and perhaps the most important, he understood. If nothing else, I knew that everywhere he looked that evening, he found himself where he had always been with his family, the center of the circle, the source and subject of our abiding love. That was a guy who was truly seen. By now you'd think I'd be a regular old Sigmund Freud. I've spent several years thinking about the problem of how to see others deeply and be deeply seen. You'd think that by now I'd be able to walk into a room and pierce into people's souls with my eyes. You'd think I had the ability to burst forth with earth-shaking insights about who they really are. You'd think I'd glide through parties as a brilliant illuminator, leaving all those diminishers feeling inferior and ashamed. But if I were to honestly assess how much I've mastered the skills I've described in this book, I would have to say, a lot of progress has been made, but there's still a lot of work yet to be done. For example, yesterday, the day before writing these final paragraphs, I had two long conversations. I had lunch with a young woman who is leaving her current job, moving across the country with her husband, and trying to figure out what to do with her life. Then I had dinner with a government official who is facing an enormous amount of partisan criticism. That these people even came to me for conversation and advice is a sign of progress, I suppose. People rarely approached the old David ready to display vulnerability and seeking accompaniment. But in each case, I now realize, I missed the moment. There was a crucial moment in each conversation, and I did not have the presence of mind to pause the flow of talk so we could linger and go deep on what was just said. At lunch the woman said she was going to spend the next four months soul searching. I could have stopped the conversation and asked her what exactly she meant. How was she going to do the soul searching? Had she ever done this kind of soul-searching before in her life? What did she hope to find? Similarly, my dinner partner mentioned that he was terrible at staying present with people. 
he'd be in the middle of an important meeting with someone and his mind was always going back to reconsider something that had already happened or leaping forward to think about something he had to do later in the day. That was an important confession. I should have stopped him to ask him how he had become aware that he had this weakness, had this flaw marred his relationships, how did he hope to address the problem? After this one day's encounters, I realized that I have to work on my ability to spot the crucial conservational moments in real time. I have to learn how to ask the questions that will keep us in them, probing for understanding. At the end of this book, I'm going to try to assess myself honestly, in the hopes that the exercise will help you assess yourself honestly. My chief problem is that for all my earnest resolutions and all that I know about the skill of seeing others, in the hurly-burly of everyday life I still too often let my ego take control. I still spend too much social time telling you the smart things I know, the funny stories I know, putting on the kind of social performance that I hope will make me seem impressive or at least likable. I'm still too much of a topper. If you tell me about something that happened in your life, I'll too often tell you about something vaguely similar that happened in mine. What can I say? I spend my life as an opinion columnist, the habits of pontification are hard to shake. My second problem is that I still possess a natural diffidence that, I suppose, I will never completely overcome. I know that being a loud listener is important, but my face and demeanor are still more calm than responsive, more tranquil than highly emotive. I know that every conversation is defined by its emotional volleys as much as what's actually said, but open emotion sharing is still a challenge. The other day at a dinner party, I looked across the large table and saw my wife and a woman sitting next to her locked in conversation. They were looking directly into each other's eyes and talking with such rapt attention and delight that the other people in the room might as well have not existed. Then I glanced toward another part of the room and saw two acquaintances leaning into each other, their foreheads close, one with his hand on the other's shoulder, bonding with such palpable friendship that they were like a single dyad. For some of us reserved types, that kind of easy intimacy remains a challenge. On the plus side, I think there's been a comprehensive shift in my posture. I think I'm much more vulnerable, open, approachable, and, I hope, kind. My gaze is warmer, and I see the world through a more personal lens. Even when we're talking about politics, or sports, or whatever, what I really want to know about is you. I'm more aware of your subjectivity how you are experiencing your experience, constructing your point of view. I'm a lot better at taking average conversations and turning them into memorable conversations. Plus, I've learned a lot more about humanity. I know about personality traits, how people are shaped by the life task they are in the middle of, how people are formed by their moments of suffering, how to talk with someone who is depressed, how to recognize the ways different cultures can shape a person's point of view. This knowledge not only gives me some expertise about people in general, it gives me more self-confidence as I approach a stranger or walk with a friend. When I'm talking with a person, I know what to look for. I'm much better at asking big questions, much better at sensing all the dynamics of conversations, much bolder when talking with someone whose life is radically different from my own. When somebody gets truly vulnerable, I don't freeze anymore, I'm having fun, honored by their trust. The wisdom I've learned and tried to share in this book has given me a clear sense of moral purpose. Parker Palmer's words ring in my head, 
every epistemology implies an ethic. The way I try to see you represents my moral way of being in the world, which will either be generous and considerate or judgmental and cruel. So I am trying to cast the just and loving attention that Iris Murdoch wrote about. Having written this book, I know, in some concrete detail, what kind of person I seek to be, and that's a very important kind of knowledge to have. An illuminator is a blessing to those around him. When he meets others he has a compassionate awareness of human frailty, because he knows the ways we are all frail. He is gracious toward human folly because he's aware of all the ways we are foolish. He accepts the unavoidability of conflict and greets disagreement with curiosity and respect. She who only looks inward will find only chaos, and she who looks outward with the eyes of critical judgment will find only flaws. But she who looks with the eyes of compassion and understanding will see complex souls, suffering and soaring, navigating life as best they can. The person who masters the skills we've been describing here will have an acute perceptiveness. She'll notice this person's rigid posture and that person's anxious tremor. She'll envelop people in a loving gaze, a visual embrace that will not only help her feel what they are experiencing, but give those around her the sense that she is right there with them, that she is sharing what they are going through and she will maintain this capacious loving attention even as the callousness of the world rises around her, following the advice in that sage W. H. Auden poem, if equal affection cannot be slash let the more loving one be me. She's learned, finally, that it's not only the epic acts of heroism and altruism that define a person's character, it's the everyday acts of encounter. It is the simple capacity to make another person feel seen and understood that hard but essential skill that makes a person a treasured co-worker, citizen, lover, spouse, and friend.